Welcome aboard, Giants fans, to episode 64 of Talk is Cheap, our New York Giants podcast right here on NJ.com. Coming off of an opening week 20-19 to victory, the Giants actually won a close game. It is a new year. It sounds like some new results, so we'll get into it now. I'm Joe Gillio, joined as always by James Cratch and Dan Duggan. They cover the Giants for NJ Advanced Media. They're back from Dallas uh, after a Giants victory. James, new year. And a new outcome in these close games. But I'll tell you, watching down the stretch on Sunday night, uh, I, it felt like last year, didn't it? It did. You know, I, it was one of those situations where they had the touchdown drive. The, the defense forces a three and out. And you're thinking, okay, four-minute offense. They can run this clock down. That would be a major you know, statement for their offense to, to win the ball with the game in their hands. And then third and 12, they get an 11-yard run come oh so close, and then Ben McAdoo does the right thing, punts the ball away, high snap, so Brad Wing had a touchback, couldn't try to pin the Cowboys deep, and then you started to think, okay, this is going to happen again, this is going to happen again, but it didn't happen again, thanks in part to Terrence Williams being a, a boneheaded play, and because the defense held up. They did hold up, and they found a way to pull this one out, and and Dan, James just mentioned the four-minute offense there, and it was such a big problem last year. I mean, everyone blamed the defense so much last year down the stretch because the Giants couldn't close games, but they also couldn't run the ball late. And although they didn't keep the ball the entire time and run out the clock and take knees, I thought that four-minute offense was effective, at least flipping the field and making it difficult on the Cowboys. And I thought Jennings ran pretty well there at the end just to kind of move the ball down the field a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think – my overall take on the game, like I know Steve Plitty to report card, I'd say I'd give like a B to a B plus, and, and everything they did I think fits in that. Like that four minute offense, I think people are going a little overboard because I mean it's called four minute offense. They got the ball three fifty seven and they had to punt, so it wasn't exactly perfectly executed. But like you said, definitely uh, a big improvement from what they did last year. And picking up a couple of first downs was huge there. Obviously, you know they could puff their chest out a little more if they just ran it down their throats and you know ended with the ball and taking a knee. Uh, but certainly. The key things they did there was they, they burned about three minutes and probably more importantly forced the Cowboys to use all three timeouts because oh, obviously as we saw as that game ended, if the Cowboys had one more timeout in their back pocket, it uh, could have been a much different outcome. All right, so Dan just talked about the B-plus that Steve gave this. James, when you look take – and we'll get into the offense, the defense, what we liked, what we didn't from this game and looking moving forward. But as you sit here now, we're doing this podcast on a Tuesday morning. How do you feel and how do you think the Giants should feel about this victory? I mean, on one end, you have a road victory in the division, which you never have to apologize for. On the other hand, you know, the Giants were playing a team with their backup quarterback, albeit he looks like a talented backup quarterback. But, you know, that they had to eke that one out. And I think a lot of people went into the game and said, and I think, James, you said it last week, the Giants, you thought, could really go down there and play well and win this game without sweating out. So do you think Giants fans should feel good? on his Tuesday morning looking forward to week two or a little bit of, like, wow, that, that was difficult. I think they should feel good. I mean, yes, they, they had to eke it out. They only won by a point, but I don't. it's not like Dak was going up and down the field on the defense and the offense just bailed them out. And I thought the defense played pretty well, you know, especially in the second half. I thought Dak looked really, you know, they didn't get enough pressure on him in the first half. He looked really good. The second half, I, it, they didn't have any sacks and, there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, it wasn't like every play they were breathing down Prescott's neck, but I thought they kind of unsettled him in the second half. He was a little bit rougher. And then, you know, I just thought the defense played pretty well. They had stops when they had to get stops, you know, especially when the offense kind of went through that stretch for the third quarter and, and the start of the fourth where they weren't doing anything. The defense didn't let the game get out of hand. So, yeah, I think the Giants the fans should feel good about the win. The, the offense was inconsistent, but I go back to the fact they had – Two 75-yard touchdown drives in the first half. Both of them took less than four minutes. And then they gashed the Cowboys on the ground with the run game in the second half, which is something they never did last season. So, yes, there were some tough points. The offense kind of got out of sync there for a little bit. But all in all, I think it's when the Giants fans and the Giants should feel good about. Dan, are you on the same page with that? Is the glass half full for you or is the glass half empty based on how the Giants win the game. And obviously they got a victory, and that's always, you know, people are always going to be jumping up and down about that. But the way they did it, how do you view this this victory here over the Cowboys? Yeah, I mean, I think it has to be half full because they won the game. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, that's really all that matters. I mean, you know, last year, the, a lot of similar situations, they lost the game, and, and we saw how that turned out. But um, there's definitely, I wouldn't say, you know, start punching your tickets for the Super Bowl or anything like that. There, there were some signs, uh, you know, of some weaknesses and obviously some, some signs of encouragement. 
I think the biggest thing is I don't know how good Dallas really is. I mean, Prescott, I feel like you know, he, he was efficient. Uh, kind of took what they gave him underneath. But, I mean, Drew Brees is going to be a much uh, stiffer challenge this week. And, uh, you know, the Cowboys' defense isn't exactly world beaters either. So, good to go down there and get a win. I think the Giants can play a lot better too, though. I mean, it was, it was kind of a funky game. The way the Cowboys basically just played keep away for, you know, at least the first half and, and really, you know, every drive, they were, they were killing a lot of clock. The Giants didn't have a lot of possessions. Uh, tough to get into a rhythm. I think they had a stretch there, though, for about 20, 25 minutes to that second half where they just weren't in sync offensively. You know, kind of started with that interception Eli threw where, where he and Sterling Shepard kind of weren't on the same page. And uh, they kind of just kind of just survived that, that, you know, big chunk of the second half. I think the defense uh, definitely stepped up there and, and kept the Cowboys in check. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just, hey, it's the opener. It's always dangerous to overreact to this. I mean, it's obviously a lot better to, to be sitting here talking about uh, you know, some of the faults in a win, uh, which obviously hasn't been the case for a long time for this team after a uh, week one game. No, it hasn't. Five years, uh, to be exact, since the Giants, <clears throat> excuse me, won a, a, a opening game, and they lost a lot of those to the Cowboys. So, James, when, when we look forward here to this team and what they did, and we look back, I should say, at the game on Sunday and what they did defensively, I mean, Dan just mentioned the time of possession. I think it was 12.32 to 2.08, I guess it would be, in the first quarter. Dallas basically just held the ball the entire time. Um, and on one hand, you're like, the Giants can't get off the field. On the other, they weren't allowing touchdowns. They weren't allowing big plays, which was, you know, both of those things were problems last year. It was kind of a bend but don't break mentality early in that game. New look defense, expensive defense. They made a lot of changes. What did you think in particular, James, of the new guys? The one thing that stood out to me early, at least, um, was Olivier Vernon. If Giants fans weren't very familiar with him before, if you didn't get the chance to watch him much with the Dolphins, maybe – other than the game the Giants played against the Dolphins last year on Monday night, he's not just a pass rusher. And we've talked about this before, but you saw it in a game with him in the blue uniform on Sunday. He plays the run as well. I, I thought that was a big key early on. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Vernon looked really good, I thought. He, he didn't. He got some pressure, uh, not a whole lot. I, I thought visibly Jason Pierre-Paul had, had more you know pressure, more shots on Dak Prescott than Vernon did. But Vernon was excellent in run defense, I thought. Damon Harrison, you know, the, the run defense was really strong on, on Sunday. Damon Harrison was right in the middle. He was getting a push, clogging up lanes. I thought Janoris Jenkins played really well on Des Bryant. I mean, I know DRC had some of the coverages, but Des only had one catch for eight yards. You know, he did have a touchdown called back, so you have to take, take that into account. But I thought Jenkins played really well, and he was a guy that I think fans were concerned about in the preseason because he kind of got off to a slow start in camp. And I know Jonathan Casillas was here last year, but – I feel like he's a new guy because the Jonathan Casillas we see on the field now looks nothing like the Jonathan Casillas we saw last season. His uh, neck injury that he had in training camp last year must have really been an issue because he's looked like a changed man. I and mean, he's the best linebacker the Giants have on the field right now, which is something I don't think anyone expected them to say coming into this season. He was every play, it seemed, he was in on a tackle. Yeah, where did that come from? Before we go back to Dan, I mean, James, you saw him last year. Was it the injury? I was shocked. And we didn't even mention him much uh, on the podcast leading up to the season. Maybe his name came up a couple times, but it wasn't like we talked about, you know, how Cassius is going to have a big year this year. Where did that come from? Do you think the Giants always thought he could do this and last year was compromised? Because that I, his name kept coming up. I feel like Joe Buck said his name five or six times, uh, you know, in, in big plays that he was making uh, during the broadcast on Fox. Joe, the thing about Casillas is he's a guy who, for most of his career, where he's you know he's been places, he started as a special teams guy. He's a really good special teamer, and then he's kind of you know due to injuries or whatever, kind of moved into a starting role. But this is really, I think, from what I've seen, maybe his first or second season where he's gone into Week One as a starter. I don't think the Giant. I mean, I think the Giants thought he was a good player when they signed him. Obviously, they wouldn't have signed him otherwise. But he, I think they brought him in as a special teamer. He wasn't even a starter last year until JT Thomas got hurt. You know, Thomas started 11 games last year at weak side linebacker. But with Thomas, I mean, now he's on IR. But when he missed the offseason program, because he has kind of stepped into that void at weak side linebacker, he took the position, he's run with it. And and now he's, I, I don't, I mean, Devon Kennard played half the snaps or a little bit over half the snaps on Sunday. So Casillas is the best linebacker the Giants have, which is something I don't think anyone expected us to be saying right now, but he's looked the part. He has, and he played a big role. So the defensive line, obviously with Vernon, uh, played pretty well, stopped the run. You had linebacker Casillas play well. Dan, what did you think of the secondary? I mean, Darian Thompson, rookie back there, was making some plays, and 
I think obviously the thing that stands out with the box score, at least, is Des Bryant was very quiet against the Giants' corners. Yeah, and no, I'm very encouraged by the secondary. Uh, obviously, you know they made some moves to to shore that up. And Janoris Jenkins, of all the you know the big money free agent signings, he was the one who had the most question marks. Now it's one game, but uh, he had a heck of a job on uh, Des Bryant, especially because you know, even Spag said last week that you know we're going to just keep these guys on one side, and not follow uh, receivers. That's what they did all preseason, all summer. And then they come out and more or less uh, put Jenkins on Dez all over the field. Not, not that he was one-on-one on, on an island with him, uh, but he drew that matchup. And, and like you said, one catch for eight yards, and, and uh, Jenkins wasn't even covering him on that play. So uh, certainly a, a great start for him. And DRC drew that matchup a few times, and, and he made a big play in the end zone to break up a pass. I think Eli Apple had what you'd expect for a rookie. Uh, you know, he had a, a few um, plays where he didn't look so great, but he got better as the game went on. And the fact that he was out there so much, again, just shows how much faith they have in this kid. And the safety play was, was pretty solid, too. I mean, obviously, you know, Jason Witten is going to kill this team forever. So just <laughs> you got to just accept that. Uh, but they did a good job of limiting any big plays. I mean, you know, you can take eight-yard dump-offs to Cole Beasley and and Jason Witten at the expense of not giving up 40-yard bombs to Des Bryant. So that was clearly uh, a part of the game plan. Uh, so, yeah, I think overall the secondary did great. Um, Daniel Thompson, that whole plan of limiting him didn't last very long. He was out there on the third series, and uh, I, I'm, you know, I don't have exactly uh, the snaps he played, but he played pretty much the majority of the game from that point on. And uh, he just looks like a guy who's comfortable. The fact that he doesn't stand out in a negative way is you know, a good sign for his first game, and he, and he made a few plays. So, yeah, I, w- I would feel very good about where the secondary is after one game. Yeah, I do too. I mean, they look pretty good out there and against one of the best receivers in the NFL. All right, before we move to the offensive side of things and talk about Eli and, and obviously Victor Cruz and, and the play he made and uh, the headlines he made closing out that game and helping the Giants win the game, I want to get both your takes on just what you saw from Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott. I mean, beyond what they did stats-wise and against the Giants, just your thoughts on them seeing them in person because as we move forward with the NFC East, I mean, they're both going to play pretty big roles here in how this division shakes out. James? For you, Prescott, Elliott, uh, a lot of hype, obviously, for different reasons, but a lot of hype for both of them coming into the season. What were your impressions watching them? I thought Prescott was pretty good. Uh, I, I thought to myself, you know, the Giants may have seen their, you know, their next NFC East nemesis for the next 10 years. I, I, look, I, he's definitely a rookie. I thought his first half was really impressive. His second half, not so much. I, I thought he made some poor throws in, in the second half. You know, he there's a couple balls he kind of threw behind people that, you know, he there were a couple drops too, but I didn't think he was as sharp in the second half. I, I think his speed definitely provides something. You know, the Giant, the, the Cowboys didn't do too much of it, but they did. They really hurt the Giants on play action a lot. They ran that option play, which I think you see is shut down, but you know, I could see that being a, a pretty devastating, you know, option in their playbook for them. As for Zeke, you know, look, I, I looked at you know, look at the tape. There wasn't much place for Zeke to run. I, I think Zeke is Zeke. He's going to be a star, you know, a Pro Bowl caliber running back in this league. But you know, the Giants' run defense was just sensational on Sunday. So I, I don't think you really can, you know, hammer Ezekiel Elliott for not having a great game because the Giants' defense was really good up front. All in all, though, I, I don't. Maybe Dan will disagree with me or agree with me. I don't think the Cowboys. They need Tony Romo back because I don't think that Dak and that run game, as good as the offensive line is, is going to be good enough to sustain a playoff drive over 16 games. I just, I, I look at that team and I think they look like sort of like they were last year. They're a good team. They're going to be in every game, but they might not have that, you know, extra punch at the end to, to come over the top and win a lot of games. So I thought Dak looked good, but he's a rookie. And I, I think that team needs Romo if they're going to have any hope this year. You agree with that, Dan? I, mean, I, I kind of thought all summer the all the Dak Prescott hype, but I know that's what happens, especially when it's a Cowboys rookie in the preseason. I just thought it was kind of disrespectful to how good Tony Romo's been for all these years that a guy's going to come and play right away and they're going to be just fine without Romo. And I, I mean, I think Prescott's going to be a good quarterback, but I thought it was a little over the top. What did you think of them? And do you agree with James that they need Romo back to have a chance here? Yeah, I agree with kind of the points both of you guys made. I mean, I think that Prescott was better than I expected. I thought a little bit was just preseason hype, but – uh, you know, he was pretty composed in there. I mean, obviously, a rookie in his first game isn't going to be perfect. Um, but I thought he did enough to put them in position to win the game. But, yes, I mean, he's not Tony Romo. Uh, certainly not yet. Uh, and, obviously, the Giants don't play the Cowboys again until December 11th. So, odds are Tony Romo will be, you know, long back by then. Now, will he stay healthy long enough to make it to that second matchup? It's probably the better question. 
Um, but so they might not even see Dak Prescott again for a year or two for all we know. Um, so, I mean, I think that they can kind of move on from him most likely. And, and with Elliot, yeah, I mean, I saw him playing college and obviously he got up to a great start in the preseason. I, I think that will probably be his worst game all season. Obviously the Giants had a lot to do with that, but you also look at Alfred Morris had, you know, seven carries for 35 yards. And I think in a way that the Giants got a little bit of a break that for some reason, the Cowboys kept feeding Elliot when Morris clearly, uh, you know, was finding something, he was finding some room that Elliot wasn't, but I wouldn't think that that's a sign of things that come from Ezekiel Elliott. I'm sure he's going to have some big games, but I think really when you look at the Giants' defense, that run that run defense is you know probably going to be the strength, and it certainly showed up on Sunday. All right, let's look at the other side of the ball now, the offense, and I think this is the area Giants fans expect a lot out of, and the NFL teams expect a lot out of the Giants' offense. And uh, James, it was a weird game. Dan mentioned this earlier, just the kind of the back and forth, the time of possession, the Giants really couldn't get going. Um, they put up 20 points, they win the game. They make some big plays, as you mentioned, James, before, with, with quick strikes, especially the one after one of the long Cowboy drives. How would you assess the offense? I mean, it was, it was I think, some worry there with the offensive line, a lot of worry all summer long. Would you say they played well? I mean, obviously they can play better, but kind of how would you assess this first game with the offense in Dallas? I thought that with the quick strike offense, with the, the two last two drives of the game where the run game really got moving, the Giants showed an ability to be – a pretty dangerous group, you know, especially since, you know, Sterling Shepard had a touchdown catch. Victor Cruz had a touchdown catch. Uh, Beckham didn't find the end zone, but he made, he had a big catch. He made some big plays. You saw, you know, Larry Donnell in the end zone with a touchdown grab, you know, Giants fans. That's why he's on the team. I know there's a lot of frustration, although I thought Larry Donnell blocked really well on a couple of those run plays at the end of the game. There was uh, one, I believe the, uh, the first half, the 17-yard run that Jennings had, that was kind of the Giants' first big run of the day, Larry Donnell kicked out his guy downfield and opened a hole for Jennings. So I thought Will Ty blocked well, too. So I think there's a lot of positives for the Giants out of this game on offense. They just have to worry about the fact that they had that stretch for the third quarter going to the fourth quarter where they didn't do much of anything. And the defense held tough, but when you're playing teams like the Packers, the Maybe even the Saints uh, on Sunday, you know, you can't really disappear for a quarter, you know, a quarter and a half and expect to win the game. No, you can't. And I guess if they're going to be a quick strike offense, they, they might be able to, you know, get away with two or three bad possessions or, you know, no, no movement on a possession because they could strike quickly on the next one. But against good defenses, that might be tough. And this probably wasn't a very good defense with all the pass rushers they're missing. But the Giants, I mean, Dan, how would you assess him? Mean, we worried all all summer about the offensive line. I thought the offensive line, specifically in the run game, they did a pretty nice job on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, I put the offense in that B-plus category I was talking about earlier. They showed a lot of flashes of, of kind of what they can become. It didn't feel like they put it all together. And again, I go back to the fact that it was just sort of a strange game. Didn't have a lot of possessions. Was you know Never really got into that rhythm where they were really clicking. But you, know, you saw a little bit from everybody that you wanted to see. You know, Odell has the long catch to set up the first touchdown. Sterling Shepard made a phenomenal touchdown catch there. Um, and obviously the Victor Cruz factor. I mean, he looked a- as good as you'd expect. And uh, obviously he didn't have a bunch of yards, but he comes through in the clutch with kind of a veteran savvy play to find the open spot for that touchdown. Uh, offensive line was clearly better uh, than they had been all preseason. And you saw more from the running game than you've seen. So, you know, I'm kind of just touching on everything there because I think everything was just good, not great. And I think that's what Eli said yesterday on the radio. Uh, good, but not great. Uh, but certainly, again, it's week one. Uh, you could you could certainly have had a, a lot worse start based on where they were in the preseason. So uh, I think the offense is going to be fine. I mean, I think you know Odell is going to have much bigger games, obviously, and and that's going to open things up for other guys. So I think so far so good. What was the most encouraging? I'll throw that at you guys. Well, James, we'll start with you. What was the most encouraging? Because I think there was a little bit of encouragement, as Dan just mentioned, there with a whole bunch of different aspects or certain individuals well, of the whole offensive output and performance on Sunday against the Cowboys. Which one thing was the most encouraging to you? Uh, the way the run game responded late in the game, I thought, by far. You know, they had some quality runs early in the game. But, you know, both of those drives, were, you know, if you've never been to AT&T Stadium in, in Texas, the, both those drives were coming toward us in the press box. And the Giants' offensive line really, really, really beat up the Cowboys up front on those two drives. They were making holes. They were moving bodies. Jennings and Vereen were hitting the holes hard. They were getting big gains. They were gashing the Cowboys' defense. That was something that I I haven't seen the Giants do since I've been covering the team. I thought, you know, 
obviously you want to do that through the whole game, and, and there still were some you know minimal or, or no or negative gains runs that they had, but for the most part they were pretty consistent. They they were you know they were kicking butt up front at the end of the game, and that's what the Giants I think have to do to set up that pass game is look, we know they've got all the receivers, they've got all the weapons, but if the run game is there too, they're going to be really tough to beat. Where would you go, Dan? Most encouraging thing. I mean, Victor, you mentioned Victor Cruz was back deep pass to Odell Shepard with the big catch, the running game. Where was the most encouraging thing for you? I think I'll probably go with Victor Cruz. I mean, again, you know, four catches for 34 yards and a touchdown. That's not going to, you know, win you your fancy football matchup. Uh, But for what the giants have on offense, I mean, He's their third receiver right now. I mean, think about that. This is a guy who obviously has been a number one. He's been a star. Uh, if he can, if he can be their third receiver, and you know, he looked healthy. I mean, he, you know, he didn't show any signs of uh, you know, kind of favoring anything. And obviously, he came through the game fine. So all that's obviously encouraging. But if you have Odell, who's obviously going to draw a ton of attention, Sterling Shepard certainly looked the part. Like he'll be capable of being the number two. Uh, has to get through some of those rookie mistakes, like he had on the interception. But again, if Victor Cruz is your third receiver. I mean, who was in that role last year? Preston Parker. I mean, it's just a it's a huge upgrade. Uh, I think he's only going to get better. I mean, it's you know his first game in almost two years. So I think that everything you saw from Victor Cruz, basically since he's come back from the groin injury, uh, has been promising. He keeps making progress. So I think the fact that that might be your third receiver uh, will take this offense to a whole nother level. Yeah, it could. And if he's anything close to what Giants fans remember, the offense, uh, there's going to be a lot of weapons out there uh, for Eli Manning to work with. Maybe one of the best group of weapons uh, he's had to work with in his entire career. So that that's definitely encouraging here. We haven't spoken much about Ben McAdoo, and I know he kind of tried to downplay uh, his first victory as a coach in the NFL after the game, and he said something to the effect of, you know, he'll let it sink in in February. Hopefully, I'm, I'm sure that he was kind of thinking when the Giants season comes to an end. How did you guys think Ben McAdoo performed? I mean, I, I, the one thing that I think stood out from a television perspective, I'm sure you guys saw it, but there's probably a lot going on from where you are in the press box. On TV, um, they made a, not a big deal, but they showed him screaming at Larry Donnell at one point uh, on the sideline because Donnell did not get off a block, um, or did not get off the line of scrimmage to get open for a route that Eli tried to hit him on. So, I mean, just the emotion from Ben there, um, you saw it, it kind of reminded me of Tom Coughlin a little bit, but what did you think, James, of, of McAdoo's first game? And obviously he called the plays, which was, um, you know, we w- wondered about that all summer long. Yeah, was was that really so difficult to let us know he was going to call the he plays? He wouldn't tell you, though. You kept I asking. Mean, I just, you know, my, my whole thing, like, we all knew McAdoo was going to call the plays because as, I, as I've said, I don't know if I've written it, but I've said it several times this summer. I understand the idea of, you know, the, the play calling tendencies and you don't want to tip the Cowboys off, but, but two thoughts on that. One. I'm pretty sure the Dallas Cowboys had something prepared in case Mike Sullivan called the plays. I don't think an NFL team is just going to leave that to the chance. Two, Mike Sullivan called the plays several years ago with the Tampa Bay Bucks, where he had nowhere near the – I mean, I think Josh Freeman was his quarterback at that point. Well, correct? Uh, I think so. In, in, yeah. in Tampa Bay, yeah. Anyway, I mean, I know they had Doug Martin, but look, they didn't have – I don't think that they had the talent – on offense in Tampa that they have here with the Giants. And two, Greg Schiano was the head coach, so they were running kind of a, you know, not they were not exactly running a high flying offensive scheme there. I don't think they were taking the, the, the gambles that the uh, that McAdoo's offense may take. So I thought that, you know, I understand his logic behind it, but my thought process was, well, A, everyone knows you're gonna call the plays because you saw what happened with Mike McCarthy in Green Bay. I don't think Ben was going to repeat that mistake, you know. And more, Ben got the job because he he's the offensive coordinator. He calls plays. They've had two top ten offenses. You know, they didn't give him the job because they like his clerical skills. So it, that's all over with now. I'm sure you know Ben will say that it's not permanent or anything, but he's going to call the plays. I thought he coached pretty well. You know, Dan had a thing up on NJ.com about the clock management. Uh, little. Question, I don't want to say questionable, but you know there were some questions to be asked about the way they handled the end of the first half, letting the clock time run off. It meant nothing, of course, but they scored a touchdown. But I thought, you know, no issues. You know, everything was handled well. You know, they they didn't have any, you know, real questionable personnel decisions. You know, in terms of the starting lineup, uh, they they moved the ball pretty well on offense. The defense played well. You know, no no meltdowns at the end of the game. So I thought it was it was a good first step for McAdoo, and I was right. They are, I had the over that he would get questioned or criticized. 
after week one, and I don't think anyone's really questioning him. So I guess I won that one. Yeah, so far so good on that. And yeah, just to, to throw it out there, it was Josh Freeman in his, his two years as the offensive corner of the Bucks. He had Josh Freeman and Mike Lennon as his quarterback. So it's not exactly uh, not uh, exactly the, Eli. Yeah. Exactly. So we, we could probably uh, take a little bit from that with uh, with Mike Sullivan. Uh, Dan, for you, Ben McAdoo's first game as a head coach in the NFL. I mean, it kind of got overshadowed, I thought, just because it was Giants-Cowboys, because of Cruz, because of Prescott, Elliott. I, I mean, I know you guys were, weren't were watching the TV broadcast, but I just they didn't they didn't do much on McAdoo uh, as I thought they would have with his first game as Giants head coach, but there was a lot of other stuff, storylines going around. But what did you think of, of how he coached? And, um, and again, as James mentioned, you, you wrote about the time management. Well, first off, James shouldn't, you know, gloat so much about winning that bet because, I mean, I'm in the media, so maybe tomorrow I can go and question Ben and uh, and win that bet. Still, it's still it's still week one, I guess technically. Um, you can you can actually you can definitely win that. Just go yeah, do it. I, I, yeah, I, I have control over this bet, you know. Um, but anyways, yeah, there wasn't much to question, you know. I think as far as you're saying, he didn't, you know, he wasn't a big storyline. I think that's a conscious effort. I mean, anyone who's listened to a Ben McAdoo press conference, it seems like he kind of is trying to be a Bill Belichick disciple. I mean, he gives nothing. I mean, after the game, how did it feel? You know, I'll, I'll think about it in February. I mean, he gives nothing. So if you're trying to do a, a fluffy feature on him, if you're, uh, you know, on the Fox uh producers you're not going to get much so I guess you just move on to Victor Cruz and then Odell Beckham because they're going to give you a little bit more but I think that's fine I mean that he doesn't need to be you know in the headlines I mean he's got a a job that's so high profile this team's going to draw attention you don't need your head coach being Rex Ryan so that's that as far as the actual game management as you guys mentioned I I kind of broke down all the big decisions he had and uh, a lot of them were 50 50 type calls and uh, you know, I think he made the right decision in most cases. They worked out either way. So, you, you know, you get 100% uh, in that regard, obviously, because that's all that matters that the, the decision works. But, yeah, I mean, you have a fourth and one uh, with a minute to go, and, and he decides to punt. And that's a huge decision for a coach to make. And, obviously, it didn't work perfectly because they got a touchback on the punt. But at the end of the day, uh, it was the right call because, you know, the Cowboys couldn't get in field goal range. And I think that was the right decision. You don't want to get stuffed there, and then the Cowboys only need about 20, 25 yards. And, with the way Dan Bailey was kicking, uh, I think they would have been pretty good shape. So, uh, you know, I mean, I think uh, it's the first time head coaching at any level, which that's kind of amazing too to think about. I don't know how many times that happens, but uh, it didn't. He didn't. It didn't look like he wasn't uh, up for the task. Uh, he handled everything well. Sounds like he was decisive, which I think is really important too. So, uh, I'd give him uh, certainly a passing grade for that first game. Yeah, I thought he did a good job, and he got off to a good start. Obviously, it's, it's always, when you get a win under your belt, everyone feels better about you, and they don't talk about you as much, uh, as kind of James predicted there. Before we talk about the matchup against the Saints, this is my thought on the game as we look forward to Sunday. We're doing this podcast on a Tuesday morning after the Giants' week one win and after the entire week one slate. I look ahead at the schedule, guys, and I, I just feel like this is a really important game for the Giants. Not, I mean, not a must win. They're 1-0. and It's week two of the season, but... They have New Orleans at home, which we'll, we'll get into here. After that, Washington at Minnesota at Green Bay, Baltimore. Do you guys feel the same thing, or, or do you not feel on that same page with this game? I, to me, James, like I'm not saying they have to win this game, but the, I think Giants fans would feel a lot better going into that stretch at 2-0, and and I'm sure the team would as well, rather than 1-1 one and one, uh, after a Saints game. No, I think they have to win the game because the Saints team – Yes, Drew Brees, and, and we'll write about, and we'll talk about this and write about it's like, Drew Brees is Drew Brees. He has owned the Giants last year in New Orleans. It was a, a defensive debacle for the Giants as he had a historic day. And yes, the Saints lost to the Raiders on, on Sunday, but I think Drew Brees still threw like four touchdown passes and 350 yards or something. So yes, Drew Brees is a major challenge for defense, but I, I think in the sense that this defense, you know, they... They're not looking in the rearview mirror, as Ben McAdoo said. This is a new year. They feel like they have moved past last year's number 32, worst in the NFL defensive situation. But that still lingers in their mind. And, you know, the the, the masterpiece of their defensive ineptitude last season was the game against the Saints. So I think it's a big for them in a sense that, you know, Brees is going to get his numbers, but I think. If they go out there and, and look, it's not a very high bar to clear. You know, if you don't give up 52 points, you're improving. But I think that for the defense, it's very important for them to go out there and play well against the Saints to keep Breeze relatively in check and win the game. I think it would be good for their psyche of, okay, we truly are a different team, a different defense. We've kind of 
exercise the demons of last year's Saints game. And on the offense side of the ball, the Saints are as bad on defense as they always are, and they're banged up. I mean, they're going to be starting, you know, basically guys off the street at cornerback. So there's no reason why Beckham and Shepard and, and Cruz and Donnell and Ty and Vereen, they all should have big games. The Giants should have plenty of offensive opportunities, especially if they can continue to run the ball. So you look at the Saints. We know about the, the offensive storyline. The Giants want to finally get Breeze, kind of keep him in check, you know, get some revenge for last year. And the Saints defense is a complete mess that the Giants should take advantage of. So, there's, I mean, if the Giants are 2-0 and by, you know, 4.30 on Sunday, then, then they, really, they really messed up, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And I think you illustrated it well. I mean, if, if we are talking next Monday or Tuesday morning and the Giants aren't 2-0, and if they didn't put up a ton of points and move the football all day, there might be a problem here and something we'll, 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 we'll deal with then, but it certainly wouldn't look good. Dan, when you look at this game, I mean, the one thing that stands out to me with, with Breeze, he played a nearly perfect game on Sunday and his team still lost at home where they're much better than they usually are on the road. Uh, that, I think, would have to bode well for the Giants at home on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not ready to put this in the you know must-win category that you know they're one and zero. And even if you look a little further down the road, I mean, the Redskins look like they stink. I mean, I'm I've been down on them all along, but I was surprised by how bad they looked last night. And the Rams, even further down the road, they looked terrible last night too. Again, things can change pretty quickly in the NFL, but uh, I think some of the tougher games early uh, maybe you're looking a little better right now. And the Saints, it's it's just one of those games where it's. It's kind of fun to watch. Probably not very fun, you know, to play for Steve Spagnuolo to look at the, the matchups this week. You know they're going to score points. I mean, it's, it's almost a given. You know, James had mentioned Drew Brees has, you know, owned the Giants. Uh, so, you know, it should be one of those video game type of games. You know, I think the Giants would probably rather not see it get into the 50s again. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's just a tough game because th- their offense is just so potent. Uh, you're going to have to outscore them. Uh, I, you know, again, I think the Giants, with all the moves they made on defense, this will be the real test. You know what I mean? The Cowboys – Great offensive line, you know, nice running game. Uh, but this is a big-time offense, so I think we'll really get to see uh, these acquisitions put to the test. I mean, this is the type of game where you can't just say, oh, well, the Giants got a little pressure. I mean, they're going to have to get to Breeze because uh, this isn't the Cowboys' offensive line. So uh, certainly a matchup they should win, but I, wouldn't, you know, I don't think you can feel comf- uh, comfortable uh, going against Drew Breeze in this offense at any time. No, you can't. And let's wrap with this. As you mentioned, Dan, I thought it was interesting you mentioned the Redskins and how they didn't play well on Monday Night Football. From each of you, and I'll give one too, a a thought on the NFC East after week one. Maybe it's just one thing that stood out outside of the Giants. Um, I'll go with this one because I pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, Carson Wentz looked like the real deal for the Eagles. Only one game we've seen quarterbacks, you know, have a flash in the pan, but he looks like he can really play. And I, I don't think it's crazy to say the Eagles may have upgraded at quarterback by moving away from Sam Bradford and giving the ball to a kid that had never played before. Um, so for each of you, give me, give me one uh, thought, thing that stood out in the NFC East. And just to throw this out there before you go, James, because I know you've always been the pro Redskins guy. I saw this stat this morning about Kirk Cousins, and I just I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So obviously everyone talked last year about how the Redskins won the division despite not beating a team with a winning record. And last night they lost to the Steelers, who we all think will f- probably finish with a winning record. So Kirk Cousins has not beating it, beat a team with a winning record since the 2012 Outback Bowl. So uh, he's got that to kind of move past if the Redskins are going to do it again this year. But James, a thought on the NFC East after week one. 2012 Outback Bowl. Well, that means he beat an SEC team. That's not bad for a Big Ten quarterback. No, he beat Georgia. That's true. Beat Georgia. I, I, like yeah, that, you, yeah. I like how you spun that into a positive <laughs> thing about Kirk. Yeah, no. Uh, basically... My, I have two thoughts on the NFC East. One, and, oh, I, I gave one thought earlier about how I, I think the Cowboys really need Romo if they're going anywhere. Uh, Carson Wentz looked really good from what I saw. I, I didn't see the whole game, but I saw snippets of it. It looked really good, but – and I, I, I listened to the No Huddle show, and I think Mark Echo brought this to Elliott's attention. They played the Cleveland Browns. Who are so all – They're all who, who I don't think are going to win a game. So – I would not get too excited at Wentz. I think there'll be rough things. Here's my thing with the Redskins. I I was surprised. I, I thought the Redskins actually were going to win last night. I watched the game. Uh, the Red look definitely. It's a concerning thing for the Redskins, and it's a concerning sign for my Redskins to win the NFC East pick. But I think there's a possibility, and I'm not saying it's definitely this, but it could be this that the Steelers are maybe the best team in the NFL. So. I'm not jumping off the Redskins bandwagon just yet. 
I think that, you know, they have a game at home against the Cowboys on Sunday. Like the Giants, they got to win that game. They got to put the Cowboys at 0 2. Then we'll see the Giants and the Redskins next week. And then the Redskins are pulling up their schedule right now. They're going to go, they have the Browns, the Ravens, the Eagles, the Lions. So if, if the Redskins are still scuffling after they get through the next couple of games, I'll say, you know what, I was wrong on the Redskins. They're not that good. But I think the Steelers, they might win the Super Bowl this year, so I'm going to hold off on panicking about the Redskins. But yeah, those so are my NFC. It's the same East. thing as the Eagles thing, right? The, the opponent. Yeah, it's just, you know, the opponent. You know, the Steelers might be top to bottom the best team in the league. And they might, and they weren't even whole. Uh, they weren't even No, whole. they weren't whole. And then, you, I mean, Wentz had a great day, very exciting. I think that you guys are right. He probably is an upgrade over Bradford, all things considered. But the Browns, they're not good. So let's see what Wentz does against the Bears, who aren't very good, but I think should be better, definitely better than the Browns this week. Yeah, well, that's that's hard to be worse than what we saw with that Browns team. Dan, uh, your thought on the NFC East after a week? Jeez, you didn't leave a lot of meat on that bone. I thought it was one thought, James. Uh, uh, <laughs> James like, all right, one thought I have two, though. <laughs> and then he went around the horn. But, no, uh, I'm going to stick to the Redskins because, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling good about being off of that bandwagon. Uh, again, I know it's one week, and I know the Steelers, they look great, and they don't even have uh, Bell, which is going to – that's really scary for the AFC. Uh, but I just am not a believer in them at all. So, obviously, I'm going to feel encouraged about my prediction based on what I saw last night. I just don't think they're that good. I mean, they went nine and seven last year. Like you said, they didn't beat any winning teams. You know, they were five and seven at one point. So it's not like this is a team that'll be following from some high stature. I just think you know sometimes teams things break right. I think that's what happened last year. But I just don't think they're a great team. And I think the Josh Norman thing has a chance to really just blow up and just be one of those kind of disastrous Redskins signings that they tend to make every off season. I mean, I don't even know if he's as good as he looked last year, or, or a lot of that was because of the Carolina defense, then you have the fact that he's already getting into things on the sideline. You have the fact that, you know, he's obviously a little frustrated that they wouldn't match him up with Antonio Brown, which makes no sense. You're going to pay all this money, bring this guy in, and you're just going to let uh, the other team's number one receiver beat up on your number two corner. Uh, just a lot of dynamics there that this thing could blow up. Again, it's one week. Steelers are good. Uh, but I'm feeling pretty good about my prediction that the Redskins are gonna gonna fall off this year. Yeah, I agree on that Norman thing. He uh, the the Panthers were very uh, very okay with letting an All Pro go, which is a, kind of a strange thing. But maybe they knew they knew more than us, and they certainly maybe knew more than the Redskins. All right, guys, we'll be back next week after the Saints game, and we'll talk about it. Uh, the Giants will either be two and zero and off and rolling, or everyone will be worried uh, with the home loss to start the uh, the home slate of games this season. James, as always, appreciate you doing this. No problem, Joe. Thank you. And appreciate you doing this, Dan. Yeah, great to be with you as always. Thanks, guys, for listening. We'll be back next week on Talk is Cheap. You can always listen to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, any way you want to listen, you can listen. And, of course, leave a a rating for the show. It helps the show grow so we can bring more episodes to you guys in the future. This was Episode 64 of Talk is Cheap.